listen to the story and what it says. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, it seemed fitting for me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, to write it out for you in consecutive order, most excellent Theophilus so that you may know the exact truth about the things you have been taught. Now this is a general introduction to the book. This isn't about Christmas. This is a general introduction. And Luke is Luke who was, who knows what his, his uh, 
his job was. He was a physician. He was a doctor. In other words, you would say he was as close to a scientist as what they had back then. And so he was concerned about facts and details and order. And so Luke is the only one, if you have to question, okay, what order do things happen in, go to Luke because he's the one who said, I'm paying special attention to those kinds of things. And you'll notice as we go through, he pays a lot of attention to detail for dates and you know what was happening where when a certain thing happened. Now let's get into the beginning of the Christmas story. Verse 5, in the days of Herod, king of Judah, Judea, there was a priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. They were both righteous in the sight of God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and requirements of the Lord. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both advanced in years. Now it happened that while he was performing the priestly service before God in the appointed order of his division, According to the custom of the priestly office, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were in prayer outside at the hour of the incense offering. And an angel of the Lord. Okay, here's where everything turns around. And an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the altar of incense. Zacharias was troubled when he saw the angel, and fear gripped him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your petition has been heard, and your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you will give him the name John. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. And he will drink no wine or liquor, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. It is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah said to the angel, How will I know this for certain? Just think about that for a second. For I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. The angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you shall be silent and unable to speak until the day when these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their proper time. The people were waiting for Zacharias and were wondering at his delay in the temple. But when he came out, he was unable to speak to them, and they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple, and he kept making signs to them and remained mute. When the days of his priestly service were ended, he went back home. Now I want you to think about this for a second. Let's, let's first of all read another passage. This is the passage that I want to use to set the stage for what just happened to Zacharias. And this is the passage that's related to my title. Everybody read the title for just a moment. Ready? Begin. He tells the prophets. He tells the prophets. Who's the he? Jesus. God. God. God tells the prophets. I want you to look at Amos 3, verses 3 through 8. And this is a passage that, uh, once again, it's got... A context. The context is that Amos is being told not to prophesy. But look at what he says. Now, let me tell you this too, if you're not familiar with this. Amos is an Old Testament prophet. Amos is speaking hundreds of years before the time of Christ. Amos says, 
Do two men walk together unless they have made an appointment? Does a lion roar in the forest when he has no prey? Does a young lion growl from his den unless he has captured something? Does a bird fall into a trap on the ground when there is no bait in it? Does a trap spring up from the earth when it captures nothing at all? If a trumpet is blown in a city, will not the people tremble? If a calamity occurs in a city, has not the Lord done it? Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret counsel to his servants, the prophets. A lion has roared. Who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken. Who can but prophesy? Now, I want to give you the context again in Amos' days. What is he saying? He's being told, don't prophesy. And he comes back with all of these pictures and their if-then uh, situations. He, he says, if this happens, then that's going to happen. If this happens, then that's going to happen. If this happens, then that's going to happen. And what is he saying? He said, if God speaks, I'm going to tell about it. That's what he's saying. But in the middle of that, he identifies a principle that I want you to underline. I want you to look near the bottom of the verses, and it says, Surely the Lord, right at the end of the fourth from the bottom, or third from the bottom line, it says, Surely the Lord, underline that, Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret counsel to his servants, the prophets. Now, I want to just say to you, most Christians don't pay enough attention to prophecy. Most Christians do not pay enough attention, attention to prophecy. What does God say there through Amos? This is how God works. He says that God always tells the prophets ahead of time what he's going to do. Now, his main point, once again, let me just make sure that you understand I'm staying within the context of Scripture. His main point is reiterated in those last two lines. The Lord God has spoken. Who can but prophesy? Here's a principle. He says, if somebody actually hears from God, who can help talking about it? I want to just ask you, has there ever been a time that it just seemed like you just flowed talking about the Lord? I'll tell you what happened before that. You sensed his speaking to you. The reason we have so much difficulty talking about the Lord is we're not listening to the Lord. And I'm going to just admit, I'm talking to me. Now I get up here and I talk every week. I have to. It's my job. But I want to tell you, I fluctuate in the ways in which I talk to people about the Lord. And you know when I am most free and most excited and most exuberant about talking about the Lord? When I've been listening to Him. Amen. When I have heard His voice. When you know that God has spoken to you. You can't help it. You talk. You share. You're excited. You, you flow with what God is doing in your life. And so the thing is, there's a principle that Amos is saying. When God spoke, then how can you help it? You can't. That's what he's saying. But let's go back. I want to make sure God identifies a way that he works. In other words, I hope you've already underlined, surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret counsel to his servants, the prophet. What does that say? In a sense, God is speaking and he's saying, this is how I roll. This is how I do things. This is how I work. I do stuff, but before I do it, I tell you I'm going to do it. I want you to make a note in your notes there. I want you to write Isaiah 46, 9, and 10. And I want you to look that up again because, not right now, but I want you to remember this. This was one of our memory verses. This is where we read, Remember the former things long past, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me. Doing what? Declaring the end from the beginning. 
How do we know that God's word is from God? Because he does something that nobody else can do. He declares the end from the beginning. Now, identify the fact that these two verses are related. It's kind of on the opposite ends of two different truths. Or excuse me, on two, the opposite ends of one single truth. Forgive me. And let me make that clear. Because Isaiah says, look back. Remember the former things long past. But Amos says, look forward. He just says, I'm not going to do anything unless I announce it through my prophets. This is an important principle. Do you know what most people are doing? They are tripping through their lives thinking that all religions are the same. They're, they're the ideas of men trying to figure out things about God. You know, every religion. They, how many of you heard all religions end up in the same place? All religions point to God. There is no religion that teaches the God of Scripture except for the Scripture. The gods that are taught by other religions are not at all like the God who says, I am God, and God says, I do something to identify that it's me talking. What is it? It's prophecy. This is important because I want to share with you, if you really start to wrap your head around the way that God has revealed himself throughout history, you will get excited and you will hear him speak. Can I just ask you, how long has it been since you could really say, man, I just heard God speak? Now, I would love to say that every time you hear me preach a sermon, God uses it in some way for you to really hear God speak. And when I talk about hearing God speak, I am not talking about hearing a preacher preach. I'm talking about hearing the Spirit of God speak to your heart. Now, that's something that every preacher prays for, everyone that loves the Lord, prays for before he preaches any sermon. But the thing is, hearing God speak is much more about you than it is about your preacher. And we need to have a heart that is listening. Because when you hear God speak, you can't help but speak. Now, I haven't even started on the outline, but let me just start that right now. I want to ask you a question. Do you love God? If you love God, this is for you. Why do I say that? Because let's go back to the very first couple verses. Luke says that he's setting these things in order, and he says that he's doing it for this individual. He says, oh, excellent, who? Yeah, Theophilus. Now, you can read all kinds of commentators, and everybody's got a different idea about this, because we have no idea who Theophilus is. There are a few Theophiluses who have been found in books of history, and maybe there was an individual, because Luke addresses the book of Luke to him, but he also addresses the book of Acts to him, and maybe he was an individual person, but even if he was an individual person, I want to tell you what his name means. Theo, which means God, and Phyllis comes from phileo, which means brotherly love. And so what he just said is, I am writing to a lover of God. Do you love God? Do you love God? Yes. Amen. That's right. We, if you love God, Luke is saying, I'm writing this to you. And I think this is something that we could take in a generalized way of, over all Scripture. When you read the Word of God, you need to read it that is something for you. It is not just a book. It's not just the ideas of the writers. This is something that God has to speak to you. Why did Luke address this to Theophilus, the lover of God? Because God inspired him to do that. And if you love God, this is for you. So I'm going to apply this to my message today because the principles that I'm about to outline for you, I want you to understand they apply directly to you. Don't you dare think that he was just preaching a good sermon for old so-and-so. Man, I wish they had been there. They really needed to hear that. If you love God, this is for you. These are principles that you need to hear. Do you love God? This is for you. 
Now I want you to look at verses 5 to 9. I'm not going to read the whole thing again. I'm just going to tell you that it says that Zacharias just happened to be doing his particular job that was just happened to be chosen by Lot. How many of you know what Lot means? What's the closest thing that we've got to Lot's today? Lottery. There, there you go. I mean, that's, that's a good... I'm thinking of something that you can hold in your hand. Dice. dice. God used dice? Yeah, as a matter of fact, I mean, the closest thing, lots were little physical things, sometimes rocks or sometimes molded things that had marks on them, and they would cast lots. And God actually commanded them in the Old Testament, not in the New Testament. Nowhere in the New Testament are we told to cast lots. Why is that? I believe because we've been, been given the complete word of God. We are to read God's word, be obedient to it, and seek the leadership of the Holy Spirit. We've been given his word and his spirit. We don't need lots anymore. But the priests were told to cast lots to make decisions. But I want you to read with me Proverbs 16, 33. Why was why did God tell them to cast lots? It says the lot is cast in the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. He said cast lots, and here it is. Because God is sovereign over chance. God is sovereign over chance. If you throw the dice, we talk about playing a game of chance. chance. But God declares that he is sovereign over chance. Now, wait a second, Pastor. Are you telling me that God manipulates every little thing? And I will just tell you, this is one of the things that theologians have struggled with. You know, if, if you stub your toe, did God make you stub your toe? I mean, does every single little thing that happened happen because he makes it happen? Well, I wouldn't say that the scripture points to that, but he knows it happens. I mean, Jesus, remember the sparrow? I mean, he said, there isn't a little sparrow that falls out of the sky without God knowing it. And he says that, that uh, you are much more important than the sparrow. And what's he followed that up with? He's got the hairs of your head numbered, and everybody knows that changed today already. I mean, every time you brush your hair, there's probably one or two that fall out. And, and the thing is, Jesus was saying that to make sure that you knew that God pays attention. God cares. And here we're told very specifically that God is sovereign over chance. Nothing happens without God's knowledge and without God's sovereignty over that. Now, why do I even mention that? Because I want you to notice in this passage... The Bible says that Zechariah was in there doing his job because he was chosen by Lot. But he was right where he needed to be. Why? You know, what if, it, what if Gabriel had showed up and Zechariah wasn't there? I mean, that may seem silly, but what I'm trying to say to you is Zechariah was right where he needed to be, right at the right time, even though it says it was chosen by Lot. But there's something really amazing. You might think I'm making too big a deal about this, but this is very, very important. We often talk about the, the prophecies that Christ fulfilled when he came. But we focus on those things that happen right around the birth. Do you understand that even as we talk about the second coming, in order for Christ to come the first time, he had to come to what? A nation. A nation named Israel. Can I just ask you, if you know anything about the nation of Israel, have you ever heard of a nation that has been so consistently and regularly hated? through history? How many people have determined to destroy Israel? I want to point out, nations do not naturally endure. Nations naturally disappear throughout history, particularly ancient history. There's a great story I've referred to him before. 
The Bible refers to the Hittites. The Bible refers to this, this nation of people that for a long, long time there was absolutely zero historical evidence of the Hittites. And the Bible talked about them over and over. And there were critics of the Bible that said, see, there, here's proof. You know, the Hittites never even existed. And the Bible talks about them as some influential people. Guess what? In the 1900s, they came across a discovery. And lo and behold, the Hittites were a people. And not only were they a people, they were an advanced and a powerful people. They, they discovered a library that was the largest and most uh, intensive not intensive, but uh, it was big. And it had a lot of stuff in it. It was a, a great advanced library. They were a people of knowledge and power. And guess what? History just wiped them out. And they were forgotten, except in the Bible. And archaeologically, there is just continually through the years been evidence of the truth of Scripture because things that people didn't know existed that we're told about in the Bible, and lo and behold, evidence will come forth. And the thing is, God said when His Messiah would come, He would come to Israel. But what happened to Israel? Israel was destroyed. In 721... B.C., 720 years before the time of Christ, the northern kingdom, Israel, was destroyed. In 586 B.C., 586 years before the coming of Christ, the lower kingdom, Judah, was destroyed. They were all carried off into exile. They were scattered among the nations. What happens to a nation when they're conquered and scattered like that, they disappear. But God's word said there had to be a nation of Israel for the Messiah to come to. And God's word referred to the priesthood. And God's word referred to the temple. And guess what? God, over hundreds of years, he brought back those people and he rebuilt the temple and he reestablished the nation. And when it was the right time, Jesus came and there was a nation of Israel and there was a temple to come to. And there was not only a temple, but there was a priesthood who had retained their line of genealogy so that Zechariah knew he was in the line of Levi. And by lot, he was standing right where he needed to stand. God said, I'm going to put Zechariah right on that spot. And guess what? When Gabriel came, Zechariah was right where he needed to be. Why? Because God has authority and sovereignty over chance. You might think, that your life is just kind of going along and God has no idea what's happening to you. But the fact is that God wants to meet you and speak to you and have you hear His voice so that you know that you belong to Him and that you're a child of God and He wants every one of us to be a lover of God and He has spoken through His Word. And here He gives us a picture of Zechariah so that we will know that God is sovereign over chance. I want you to put a picture up here. This is a timeline of world religions. You can't read any of that from where you are, can you? Well, up here at the top, this is a timeline of world religions, and it probably was put together by a Christian group because it lists Judaism as the very first thing. Now, I, I looked this up, and, and secular groups like to emphasize that Hinduism is the oldest of religions. And, of course, the way that they determine this is by the dates of writings. But Hinduism, even, you'll see a little break there. I don't know. Here's Hinduism here, and here's a little break because, thank you, Don, Hinduism... Uh, comes down from Vedic Brahmanism, and I'm not a great scholar on these things, but the importance of this is just simply to understand God said that Judaism would have to last. I mean, he said that the nation would have to endure. 
And, and there is something to be said for the existence of religions. Because I want you to notice how many of them showed up a long time ago, but then they disappeared. I mean, there aren't anybody. We tell stories about Greek mythology, but there's nobody really worshiping the, the Greek mythology. And if they were, they would be a real oddity. And Hinduism, even though it has a long history, it should not surprise us that there are old religions because the, fa the fact is that any time you turn away from God, what do you do? You start making up stuff. Do you hear what I'm saying? When you turn away from God, you just start making up your own stuff. And when the Bible was, when the, when the history from creation is given to us, what's, what follows creation? The flood. Why? Because people just started going their own way, and people got so evil that God had to destroy them. Well, guess what happened after the flood? You read the story of the Tower of Babel and God had to separate the people because they weren't following his, his leadership and because people turn away, they start making up stuff. But I want to just share with you that one of the evidences, just one, just one of the few evidences, or excuse me, one of the many evidences of, of the truth of God's word is that it has endured. But here is the pro most profound thing is that he said specifics about it that would endure, and this is not the common illustration of history. What do most religions do? They don't endure very long, or else they're recent. They're recent. And if you doubt anything about people making up stuff, read about Scientology. I mean, do you understand that one of the most popular religions among some of our most elite people is Scientology and it's not a secret this guy was a science fiction writer and he didn't make a living at it very well so he decided to invent a religion and he's become a millionaire I think making a religion that everybody knows he just made up but God spoke at the very beginning and he said I my word will endure and guess what Solid line, solid line, solid line. But that's not because Judaism meant the nation of Israel endured. The nation of Israel has been destroyed multiple times. But God said it had to be in existence when Christ came the first time. And guess what? It was. Now, by the way, it says that it has to be in existence when Christ comes the second time. So if we pray really hard, maybe someday there will be an Israel again. Do you understand that for 1900 years, that's how it was for Christians who believed what the Bible said? They prayed and they believed that there would be a nation of Israel again. And for 1900 years, there was no nation of Israel. But guess what? In 1948, there was a nation again. Exactly as God's word had it. But let's go back to the scripture. Zechariah, not only was he part of the nation of Israel because God said it had to be there. He was worshiping in the temple because God said it had to be there. And though the temple was destroyed multiple times, the temple was rebuilt when Jesus came because God said it had to be there. And not only was he in the temple, he was a priest. And he was in the exact spot. <coughs> and let's just go on with the passage. If you look at verse 10, if you look at verse 10, this is what it says. And the whole multitude of the people were in prayer outside at the hour of the incense, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him. I want you to notice what one of the first things that he said was. He appeared to him standing to the right of the altar of incense. Zechariah was troubled when he saw the angel, and fear gripped him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your petition has been heard. What petition? Where's that petition mentioned? It's not mentioned. 
We don't know when they made that petition. You could say, well, that just makes sense. If they didn't have a child, they'd be praying for a child. I want you to understand what happened here. I want you to understand. Where was he? He was at the altar of incense. And the whole crowd of people were where? Outside. Why? Because nobody, nobody, nobody got to go in where the altar of incense was except for the priest who was appointed to do that each day. That was forbidden. That was forbidden. I've said this in sermons before. The temple represented the presence of God, but the message it really communicated is you cannot approach because you could only come so close depending on who you were, and nobody could go into the altar of incense except the priest appointed to do that once a day. So what should have happened if Zechariah some, saw somebody else in there? Under normal circumstances, he said, What are you doing? Get out of here! You're not allowed in here. Get out of here. So what does that mean? He didn't just look like a man, first of all. What happened to Zechariah when he saw him? It says he was gripped with fear. There was something about this man that I want you to understand that we don't know. It doesn't describe him. Oftentimes when people see angels, it will describe him. But the fact is, it doesn't say what he looked like. It says that, that Zechariah was gripped with fear. But as angels always do, he begins with fear not. And what does he tell him? Your intercession, your prayer, your petition, God is giving it to you. Now, why is that so important? Because God is about to do something absolutely amazing. But he, his first message was a message of very intense personal, personal emotion to Zechariah. They were without a child and they had gone before God and begged him for a child. And his first message was about, I, I want you to stop and think about this. What was God about to do? God was about to fulfill his, his command, his prophecy for all of eternity. He was about to send his Messiah for the whole world to deliver salvation. But what does he start with? He starts with something absolutely personal. He starts with Zechariah. This has to do with your heart. And what I'm doing, this big plan here, has to do with your desire. Now, I want to write, ask you to write something down. That This is for you. If you love God, you need to know that God is not only sovereign over chance, but he blends his purpose with the hearts of his people. I want to tell you something that Satan wants you to believe with all of your heart is that God does not care about you. This is one of Satan's primary messages that he tries to keep people away from God and Christians, he tries to discourage them. But what does the Bible say? The Bible says, cast all your cares upon the Lord because he cares for you. Does that mean that God will always give you what you want? Let us say a resounding no. One, two, three, no! no. One of the things that causes Christians to get discouraged is they think that they're taught by some people that the purpose of prayer and the reason for faith is to get God to do what you want, and that's absolutely against Scripture. The purpose of prayer and the intent of faith is to get us to do what God wants. And some people honestly would say, well, then God doesn't care about me, does he? No, 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 no. God always blends his purpose with the heart of his people. He cares intensely about you. The verse that we quote all the time for that is Romans 8, 28. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God. To those who are called according to what? His purpose. His purpose. And I've shared with you over and over, you need to read with that verse 29, which tells what his purpose is. For who, those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. What is good? What is the definition of good? My definition of good is everything that makes me feel good. God's definition of good is everything that makes me more like Jesus. But I want you to listen also to the rest of this passage. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? 
If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? And some people, once again, they read that and they think, all things that I want? Or is it saying that he has the ability to give us all things and he's going to give us all things according to his purpose, which is to make us more like Jesus? Does he not care about our feelings? Yes, he cares about our feelings. But he wants us, our feelings and our attitudes and our desires to be conformed to his will. That is his purpose. And so that is bringing us to the next point. Why is it so important that God accomplish his will rather than our will? This is the point. God's preparations are always far beyond what we can imagine. Write this down. This is important. This is important. This is why God doesn't always give us what we want. Because God's purposes are greater than ours. And God's purposes and his preparations for those purposes are always far beyond what we can imagine. I want to read you from the prophet Malachi. For behold, it's in your notes, for behold, the day is coming, burning like a furnace, and all the arrogant and every evildoer will be chaffed, and the day that is coming will set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in its wings, and you will go forth and skip about like calves from the stall. You will tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day which I am preparing, says the Lord of hosts. Remember the law of Moses, my servant, even the statutes and ordinances which I commanded him in Horeb in all, uh, for all Israel. Behold, I am going to send you Elijah, the prophet, before him, the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. He will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers so that I will come, not come, and smite the land with a curse. What is this? These are the last words of the Old Testament. The last words of the Old Testament point towards the coming of the Messiah. But it says very clearly that before Messiah comes, I'm going to send someone that he describes as Elijah. And he's going to be, go preparing his way. And I want you to understand, look at what's happening to Zechariah. Zechariah, who was chosen by chance to be standing in that place, but God is, has thought sovereignty over chance. Zechariah, who with his wife had been praying for a child, and God blended his purpose with the heart of his people. But now as he stands before God, he is being told... God's purpose is way bigger than anything you've ever even thought of because I am sending your son as the one to go before the Messiah. I'm up to way more than you have any idea about. I want you to look at these verses in verses 18, excuse me, uh, up to 17. It's amazing what God says to him. It says, look at verse 17 again in your Bible. It is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. I want you to, I want you to notice, what are the principles that we've looked at here? God is demonstrating in the life of Zechariah, I am sovereign over chance. And my purposes... I, are work together with your heart because I care. And I have a purpose greater than anything you can imagine. And this leads up to the tremendous climax of Zechariah's response. Zechariah said to the angel, How will I know this is true? <laughs> can you believe that? Where is he standing? In the holy place where nobody can be. And here's an angel. An angel. I mean, go ahead and imagine him. Flaming skin. A, a sword of fire. Angel or angel wings spread out. I don't know what he looked like, but whatever it was, it was scary. And he says all these things. Your son is going to fulfill the scripture. God's showing all this sovereignty here. And he says, how will I know for 
here. <laughs> Destiny? I didn't put this as a separate principle, but here it is. Humanity's ability for unbelief is astounding. I want you to read the next verse. The angel answered and said, now I just wish so many times that we could see someone's face or hear the tone of their voice. I mean, I just did this little thing. I used the tone of my voice to communicate. And I was trying to say there was something tremendous and wonderful and dramatic coming. And then I communicated this was a stupid thing to say. And I'll honestly say, I think Gabriel was responding like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding? Listen to what he says. Listen to what he says. The angel answered and said to him, I'm Gabriel. Who was Gabriel? Gabriel was the same angel that came and revealed to Daniel to the very end of the ages. He was the one who revealed all of God's plan for the future to Daniel. He was the archangel, probably above all archangels, maybe equal with Michael, we don't know. But I mean, this is Gabriel. And I think he's incredulous, if, if angels can be incredulous. Maybe they're emotionless. I don't know. But if they have emotions, I think he was beyond belief. He says, I'm Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God. And I have been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. This is Gabriel. I mean, God could have sent some minor angel. This is Gabriel. He's the one that stands at the very throne of God. And God, understand, he just came from the throne of God to the presence of Zechariah. And what does Zechariah say? How can I be sure? Why, why am I making a big point? Here's why. I truly believe we have more evidence. We have more evidence. You and me, you and I, we have more evidence of the truth of God's revelation and His Word than Zechariah had. Oh, but pastor, he actually saw. Do you know that the Bible says to Peter that there is something, Peter actually says it in his first letter. He says that we have something more sure than experience. What is it? The Word of God. We have the Word of God that stretches all the way back to the very beginning of creation to this day. And unless you're not paying attention, you know that God has fulfilled Prophecy in our day. I have shared with you information that we've just gained recently from science. Genetic research is pointing to God. Study of space is pointing to God. Everything is pointing to God. We have more evidence today than Zechariah had then. Even with an angel standing right in front of him. I believe that's the truth. You and I have more evidence today but, here's the last point, verses 18 to 23. What does the angel say? And behold, you shall be silent. Let me just go ahead and put this in my words, okay? Here's my interpretation. Here's what I think he's saying. Until you believe God, you've got nothing to say. Until you believe God, you've got nothing to say. I think Gabriel was incredulous. You're kidding me. God just sent his top angel directly from his throne. And you're not sure? But I've spent my life studying God's word. And frankly, trials will come into my life. And I will quiver. And I'll say, what should I do? And I think that God looks at me and says, I have done all this. And you know about it. And you're not sure? You're not sure you can trust me? You're not sure you can be obedient to me? You're not sure you can do what I say? 
He says, until you believe God, you've got nothing to say. If you go back to verse 11, go look at... I know I'm going a little bit long. I have to say this. I have to say this. Look at verse 11. And an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing at the right of the altar of incense. See, he had all kinds of evidence. A strange, stranger appeared to him where no one could be. He called him by name. He had a fearful appearance. He knew his petition. He called his wife by name. He, the very nature of his announcement was divine. And now, Zechariah says, how will I know this for sure? And Gabriel goes through this about being the angel. But the thing is, we have more reason to believe than Zechariah did. We have a whole new round of prophecies that have been fulfilled in Christ. We have a whole new round of prophecies that have been fulfilled in our day. The nation, this little nation that fits into the Central Valley, God said it will not only come back into existence, but it will be the center of world attention. And we see that happening today in our day. We have more reason. But the question is, do we believe? And the message of Gabriel, I think, was more than just to Zechariah. If you don't believe, you've got nothing to say. And I'll be frank with you. There are times that I struggle and I present a message and I know that I, I, I communicate to you as a church. We need to get out there and we need to speak. We need to speak. But the message of this passage is that until we hear from God and truly believe, we got nothing to say. And once we actually do... We won't be able to help it. We can make a memory verse that says, Tell of His glory among the nations and His wonderful deeds among all the peoples. I want to tell you, the lion is roaring. People, the lion is roaring. The trumpet is blasting. We see it in our news. We see it in our day. We see it. God has over and over declared and demonstrated. His word is from Him. And yet, we find it hard to speak. I want to make it really, really clear. The point of this message is not get out there and speak. The point of this message is let's hear God. Whatever it takes, whatever it takes, time in scripture, whatever it takes, time in prayer, whatever it takes, just meditating on what God has already revealed to us, we need to get to the point where we know that we've heard from God in such a way that we cannot help but speak. What does, what does Amos say? Go back to the first page of your notes. The Lord God has spoken. Who can but prophesy? You might say, but I'm not a prophet. That's exactly what Amos was saying. Go back and read the first chapter of Amos. They were telling him, you can't speak. And he says, I'm not a prophet. I'm a, I'm a shepherd from Tekoa. But God spoke. Has God spoken? Has God spoken? Amen. God has spoken. But we need to hear him. Deep within. I want to encourage you. We need to hear him so that we can't help but speak. We need, do you hear me? We need to hear him so that we can't help but speak. I want to, do you know that we've been in a battle the last several years in our country, our country that was built upon Scripture, our country that was built on the principle of God's Word, we've been in a battle whether or not we have the freedom to say, Merry Christmas. Do you know how bad Satan wants to keep us silent? Do you know how bad God wants us to speak? You know what? It might even be that if we really heard from God, we might not only say, Merry Christmas. Do you, do you realize some of the prophecies that were fulfilled at Christmas? Do you realize how Jesus fulfilled prophecy? 
I mean, if there's any time of the year that it might just naturally open up a door to talk about Jesus, this is the time. It's new. We're going to stop. And I want to ask you to bow your heads right now for just a moment. The most important hearing of the Lord is when he says, come to me. You need to understand, I can go on and on about the evidence that the Word of God is the Word of God, that it came from God. God has given us signs. He's told us the evidences that this is from me. But the thing is, right now, some of you hear the Spirit of God speaking to your heart, and that's not something I can make happen. The Spirit of God is saying, come to me. Come to me. And right now, you need to say, Lord Jesus, I come. Lord Jesus, I come to you, I trust in you, I ask you to come into my life. I don't understand everything about it, but I want you to come into my life. You're God, and I want to follow you. That's what you need to do. And if you're a Christian, I want to ask you to join me, saying, God, I want you to do whatever it takes in my life to make me hear you so that I can't keep silent. I know with my head that you've spoken, but there's something in, in my life that makes it hard for me to speak. And I want to hear you speak, and I want you to do whatever it takes in my life to make it so that I cannot be silent. Please stand with me.